so welcome back. Thank you for coming back. It is um, 11.56, so we're only running six minutes behind time. It's 21 degrees in the hall, if you're concerned about the temperature. Who wants it hotter? No one? One person. Who wants it colder? No, oh, Mike. Okay, so we're, well, this is amazing. We're getting this about right. It is our number one issue on this conference, is temperature. Um, <laughs> that, um, but if that's the, the most important thing that happens, then great. I don't know what I did. I really don't. Should we just switch it off and on again? Yep. Uh, I can't even find a power button. Uh, pull out the mains. Okay, just technical challenges. Can I just re-emphasize this is my fault, not AVs. Uh, right, while we're playing with this, let me introduce the, the next two speakers. So, um, first of all, I'd like to, before I do that, I'd just like to um, uh, thank our sponsors once again. You'll see on your tables information from our two silver sponsors, Atipon and Ingenta. So uh, thank you very much for your support for the event. And uh, there's some information on the table for you to look at um, there. Um, right, I'd now like to introduce our next session. So this is a session uh, loosely gathered together around um, uh, writing, and essentially about, about how researchers write, and then also about formats in the sense of uh, creating um, book, and hi book journal hybrids. Now, I know earlier today hybrid was a dirty word, but I think in this environment, hybrid is an okay kind of thing. Our two speakers come to us from uh, the two, I think, great centers of learning in the world, Cambridge and Cleveland. And, um, sorry, I had to be done. Uh, and also, interestingly, they're, they're both masters in interesting ways. As you heard earlier, Christine is a master of rhetoric, which is deeply impressive. And uh, Nisha tells me that she's a master of archeology. span so uh, that might be less useful today, but, um, but certainly entertaining. Um, so I'm just going to invite Christine to, to come up and, uh, and start her presentation. Uh, could you give her a warm welcome? Thank you. Yes, I'm from Cleveland. <laughs> All right. OK, so I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about uh, a point of view from well, my point of view as a researcher. I know there's not too many of us, but there are a few of us here. Are there other researchers out there that maybe want to wave at me? Hello. Let's all meet for coffee later. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this conference I've seen so far is the relationship between the librarians, the publishers, and the researchers. And I actually work at an intersection of all of those areas at the moment. So I just wanted to say that prior to these slides. Um, I, I am a professor of English. I do do research at the university. I'm tenured. I'm a full professor. Um, but I also have a relationship with the library where I do faculty or academic a researcher writing support and so as part of that one of the things that I have to do is work with early career researchers and get them writing and part of that entails me running workshops there and also through a partnership with other universities to run workshops for faculty or academics at other institutions and so I work with a lot of folks that have a hard time publishing so yes okay so can I get the next slide please since I can't I don't think I can click it can I <laughs> Oh, yeah, I can click it. I just can't see it on there. Okay. Maybe. Let's see. All right. All right. So let's start with a narrative about publication that we have probably heard before, just as a quick glimpse into what we'll be working with today. And so where, where the traditional publishing chain has happened, at least for me, even when I started as an academic in 2001, is that you had an idea, you did a study, you did research, and then you send it out, you know, you wrote it up, you write up the results, right? You send it out for publication. Um, you, if you got lucky, you got your first choice journal or sometimes a top tier journal if you were, a, you know, if you're working towards a top tier. Um, in, in my case, there were a lot of journals kind of at the same tier. So you chose one, you sent your, manus your manuscript out, and then you waited for a result. Sometimes it was a rejection. Then you went to number two on your list. Then you went to number three and so on until you got a yes. And so once you got a yes, then you, had, you went through the publishing process, the manuscript was out there, and then that's, that's it. It is getting cited. It's out there in the academic cycle of research, but it's not, you know, it's not something that you're engaging with a whole lot. You might cite it again. You might self-cite. Um, you might reference it in other studies. But um, by and large, the cycle has been complete. It's out. 
So one of the things that I'm looking at today is the current life cycle and how I'm working with other academics in thinking about the publishing cycle. And that's actually my main interest in being here today. Um, as a researcher, I, you know, of course, I need to experience it and, and work with this same cycle, as does everybody else. But it, the life cycle is completely different than that linear pattern. And it's, it's really changed a lot. And I know the people in this room know this in the last you know, 20 to 25 years, um, but in the last five years especially, just in the way that we think about it. So one of the things that I will do with you today is talk about some lessons I've learned as an academic, even as a full professor, even how much the publishing industry has changed a little bit for me, and then what that also means for my relationship with the library and the publisher. So we'll, we'll focus on that a little bit as well. So I want to talk about the four bodies of research that I use to um, talk about some of these findings today. Some of it is research I've conducted, some of it is research I'm helping with, and some of it's research that I'm citing. So the four groups that I'm working with, the one group is what I would consider superstar academics. So this is my own research. I published a book called How Writing Faculty Write, and what I did was I looked at the very top 15 people in our field, in my field of rhetoric and writing. It's kind of a, a unique discipline over in the States. Um, and what I, why I was looking at those folks is because these are people that have learned about scholarly writing. That's their discipline. That's my discipline, like how to actually get folks to write, students, other instructors, and the like. And so why, you know, why I interviewed these folks was to find out, well, what habits do they have to figure out, um, you know, how they're approaching the publishing process? How are they successful? So they basically move from a study, from an idea, to a published product, and they fin finish that out. Um, so that's the first group that I'm, I'm taking as some of these findings. Another one would be um, a survey that I'm working with and consulting on uh, done by Prolifico. So some of you were in our workshop earlier this morning with Beck Evans and uh, Dee. And one of the things that I'm, I've been noticing with the survey is that is confirming a lot of the things that I'm seeing both in the superstar academic work, but also in what I would consider my field work where I go out to other universities um, in, in the U.S. right now, part of my position is to go to these other institutions, as I had mentioned, and help faculty who have trouble writing actually get the, get, you know, get the idea to publication. So I help them essentially move the needle. I do a lot of writing productivity workshops. And so as part of that, one of the things that I'm finding on, on the ground is that some of the problems that we had 25 years ago, we still have. You know, there's still you know academics that don't want to write. They're nervous. They're not. They're unsure. We talked in the workshop I was in previously about the imposter syndrome. Um, so this is a problem. And so this is something that's that's kind of happening there. And the survey research confirms a lot of the same things. So. Um, if you're looking at, now we're taking these three bodies of research. We've got these superstars that seem to be figuring out how to do it. We've got some, a survey, a large-scale survey of people at sort of all points in the game. We've also got this group of f people that I see out in the field. And I've probably worked with, I don't know, maybe 15 to 20 universities now. And it doesn't matter if the university is a very research-oriented institution, a teaching one. It doesn't matter if it's more focused on STEM fields. It, the, the problems essentially are the same and sort of the publishing issues or the relationship with publishing is, is kind of the same. And then the last group that I'm going to just briefly mention here are early career researchers. And there's a study that I've been working with a little bit, the folks on there um, as a consultant, and we're kind of working on two sides of the same discipline. So my discipline is rhetoric and writing. I've been working with sort of the superstars, the very top academics, you know, the very well-known people, the keynote speakers, those, those folks. And then these other scholars, Jackie Wells and Lars Sutter, have been working with sort of the early career folks and how they approach publishing and find a journal. And what we're finding is that the habits are completely opposite and the research is completely opposite, which I think will have some implications for us. So looking at this, these are a couple findings that just overall looking at those four bodies of research that I want to bring to the table today and then talk about a few implications for hopefully everybody in this room. But one of the first implications is that academics think rhetorically. And so what that means is that prior, even maybe 20 years ago, 25 years ago, prior to now, uh, many academics sort of, you know, they did the study first. They had the idea first. They wrote it up first before thinking necessarily about where the research was going to go. In sort of very narrow subfields, that might not be the case. You might only have, you know, one or two options to be able to do that. 
But one of the things that I, I found with this is that people are sort of moving beyond that. I'm going to wait for inspiration to strike, right? They're going to they're going to actually do the research first before finding the publication. Now it's sort of the opposite. They're already thinking with the end in mind. They might not even make the project until they've gotten to the end in mind. So I want to show you what I mean by that. And so um, this is one of the folks that I interviewed for my collection. He is currently the editor of the flagship journal in my field, which would be, um, it's called the College Composition and Communications. This is something that's largely over in the States. Um, his name is Jonathan Alexander. And so he's somebody that talks about already thinking who your audience is, and not even just in the generic way, like I want to talk to other other English professors, let's just say that for a second. Um, it's moving already behind that. It's thinking of a specific English professor you want to talk to. And so when I interviewed Jonathan, and you can see you know, some of the, the quote up here, but he does focus on this idea that if you've got a project in mind, you might start thinking about the journal, the book venue, um, it might be a multimodal venue, an open access venue, whatever that thing is, you're already thinking about that before you even write it up because you have to write it up to make it fit inside that genre. And that's not, not, that's not exactly new, but the idea of thinking of, I know five other people that actually publish in this journal, those are the people I want to talk to, to me that's a little bit new. So it's already thinking like way drill down to when somebody accesses an article or they access a book who you know who's likely to pick it up is one part of that but also it's it's part of a larger conversation that's already happening so when Jonathan and I talked about this a little bit further this part I think is is very maybe very different is that he's already thinking of say five people that are already talking about his issue but five more that are kind of peripherally interested, right? And they might pick up this, this article or they might um, look inside the journal for a reason. And then as part of that, he's helping extend the conversation. He's got a certain you know, bent of something that he wants to be happening in the article. And he wants to make sure that that same thread is carried through the journal. So it's much more of an invested interest. And I don't, I don't know if this is something that's a particularly US thing, but I have seen more and more of this where people kind of feel like this is this is my journal, this is my disciplinary home, this is my conversational home, this is my community, this is where I want to get it. And in some ways I think it's gotten a little bit smaller than thinking I want to get my ideas out to the world, you know, I want them to go out to all the journals. Um, you know, I'm kind of finding more of this where people are getting very focused down narrowly. And in some ways that makes the productivity or the publishing process a little bit harder for some because you know, if they can't get into their one or two conversational homes, they're disappointed, right? They're very, they're very hurt. So thinking about, here's another one that came up, and I'll talk about this one a little bit more because this can be controversial, but what I found is that at least with most of the academics that I work with, and, and through researching is that, yes, everybody can identify, you know, the top two or three tier journals, you know, the ones that maybe have the best research impact factor, they can figure out what, you know, what, why, why you would want to go there. They've got the prestige, they've got, you know, the readership, that sort of thing. Um, but after that, then I find it sort of a muddled mess in terms of what people will do. Like basically, you know, what's the next step? Say top one, two, and three all said no to you, what do you do? You know, so I'll come back to that point in a minute because that one I think has, has some implications for what's going to happen with open access and some other issues we've been talking about this morning. So this other part, I, I really, this is something that just because I, I am housed in a library a lot of the time for my, my workload, um, I'm really interested in this idea of, of thinking where faculty are with libraries. Because at least maybe 10 years ago, when I first I started in 2001 as an English professor, and maybe 10 years ago, I would go to work in the library and it would, the only other people would be in there would be maybe a few students, you know, not, there wouldn't be any other professors, but that's where I like to go and do some of my writing. And I got to know many of the librarians and we started talking and it was this kind of thing where I said, well, these are the things I'm working on. And the librarian started sending me things and said, oh, well, did you know we have this new journal? We just got access to this. Um, you know, here's some things that you might be interested in. And so I'm finding that more and more with, uh, academics, and in fact, we call them faculty in the US, I have to keep switching to academics or researchers here. Um, but one of the things that I, I found is that it's kind of a different mentality for how academics work with librarians. This has really been a shift in the last like 10 to 15 years. And I do think part of it is a move towards libraries doing more than just you know housing books or um, being a, a research repository. So we'll come back to that in a second. 
Um, the next one I want to show you, there's a picture up there. <laughs> it's so funny because I don't have it in front of me, but I will keep looking over there. I wanted to show you a quick um, image of what I mean by that. So our the library where I am at, I'm at the University of Finley. Um, it's south of Detroit by Cleveland, <laughs> if people are kind of wondering where the heck that is. Um, one of the things that you'll see when you look at this picture is there's a lot of people in our library. This is, this is our library. Um, they're all looking at research posters. And the one thing that is unique about this is these posters are from academics. They're from the faculty. They're not from students. It's not like some kind of student presentation going on in there. But the librarians had invited different academics to come in and do posters about their research. And then they invited in other librarians, other university members. We have several universities in our area area and made it more of a research form kind of day and the library was sponsoring that like they really wanted to get the research out there and then as part of that they tried to get the reach a little bit bigger than just our you know maybe five or six universities and libraries but um, they did they worked with faculty then in small clusters so I could work with librarians from a different university other than mine and it was this idea that they're much more of partners so then another way that I want to point, uh, point out where the librarians maybe have changed a little bit is that um, they're, they've been much more involved in the early release of research. And I know that we've talked a little bit about this this morning um, to some extent. But one of the things that happens with this is that at least our librarians now, when research comes out in one of our areas, so they know my area is rhetoric and writing. Um, I do a lot with writing productivity. So they'll know when something new comes out and it gets released early prior to being out in print or being available in any of the databases or anything like that, they'll let me know and I'll be able to get that. And I'm finding that with more library or more librarians and more academics that this is also the case. Like the librarians actually serve is like a tip-off point to help academics. And it's not that academics wouldn't know that from somewhere else, like an RSS feed or from Twitter or from some other place. It's not that they wouldn't. It's just it's another venue to get them that information. And then this part I want to talk a little bit about, because this is a little education for me as to what how I'm learning about how to promote content that I'm making. So let me show you some examples. I think this one will help. So these are all going to be some pictures of me and my book, which is kind of crazy. But this is because this is an education for me as an academic. And this is one of the, the spots where I think that um, the industry, both publishing, the librarian's relationship with academics, all of us together thinking about as researchers and readers, um, this is a spot where I really think it's changing. So I've published a book before, but for this latest book, this just came out a year ago, um, one of the very first things they had, I had to do was at a, at a conference, the first conference where this book would have been available in the exhibit hall, the publisher said, well, come by, you know, we'd like to see you and say hello. And so I said, okay. And I just showed up and I didn't really know what was happening and neither did Michael, the other guy in the picture. Well, it turns out both of us had our books published at the same time. And so they said, well, it's time for your photo. I didn't know I was taking this photo, but I was. And what I came to find out is, well, then they're going to put it out on Twitter and say, well, you know, here they are, here's the books, that kind of thing. So let me just show you the little chain of what happens next. So I gave a keynote a year ago to a well, I guess it wasn't a year ago now, but <laughs> Peck Institute on Writing Research. And this was another thing. They had actually sent folks to this institute that I didn't even know they were there to come and send more Twitter pictures of me doing that and feeding out about this book. And, you know, they were like, well, are you on Twitter? And I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> so I don't know. I might be the only one, but I'm not. And so this is another thing where they're like, no, this is something that you need to do. So they were kind of educating me as we went along. Here's another one. Um, this is somebody that I don't know, just put it out on Twitter and said that they got my book. So I didn't even know this post existed. I actually found it when I was looking to make the slides for this because I just wanted to show this, this quick chain of what's happening here. And here's another slide showing how this researcher highlighted words in my books. So of course, I was, super, I was very thrilled. It was very exciting and I am going to reach out to her. But that's somebody interacting with the text. So that's like a totally different thing where it's very public how somebody read the book, published scholarship, is like marking it. It's got the hashtag. There's all the things happening right there. And this is something that's sort of happening outside of me. It's not me. I mean, I am now, but it isn't me normally knowing about this even happening and how the research is circulating. So I think there's an opportunity there. And then here's another one where I did a podcast interview, and that also got tweeted out through the press, through the podcasters, through a couple other people that were affiliated. And th again, this is another thing. I didn't even know this Twitter or the Twitter feed was out there that's on these podcasts. So just a couple quick implications then, because I, I mainly want to leave us with some things to think about. 
So I'd like us to keep thinking in mind that we're, as academics, and now I'm speaking as me as an academic, not as library support or, or writing research or whatever, um, it, the idea that we are reading the journals or we are reading the articles or pieces or whatever we're going to make, if it's a book or a journal or you know whatever it is, we're the readers, and I, I really like this flip to thinking about it more as readers first than writers first, because writers is sort of a selfish thing, right? Like, I want to get my article published. But being a reader, I mean, you are caring about the scholarly conversation and the discipline, and I've really shifted my thinking to being more like a reader, like, what do I want in this journal? Maybe my work isn't what I really want in this journal. It might be much better somewhere else. So that's, that's an uh, implication. Um, this other quote that's on here, there, when later, there are handouts on your table, so you do not have to read this big long quote on there, but I like, this is Jonathan Alexander again, and he really talks about considering himself as part of the readership for a journal. Not just a writer, not just an author, not just a submitter, but he's reading it. So anybody that wants to look at that, um, kind of the smaller things that are hard to read, they're on some handouts on your table, you can check those out. Um, here's another thing, because remember I just said that from two to three, like after the top two or three journals, rank matters less. This has been the case, I work with the University of Michigan a lot, and University of Michigan is, you know, is a very top university. This is the same there as it is you know, with some very smaller, like even like in a community college, if some of their tenured faculty need to do you know, occasional publication, that sort of thing. Um, and so here's an opportunity. Like I found that it really, people get very excited about open access and some of the other things happening. So. Um, yes, it doesn't mean that the top tier journals aren't important, it's just that the window I think is open to consider other possibilities once you're past those one or two. And it doesn't mean you're rejected, you might not even go for one of those top tier journals. You might choose to actually start in the middle. So something that I think might be an opportunity. Um, I want to show you just two quick slides to show you what I mean by that. Enculturation is a journal in my field. It's di born digital. It's a totally online, open access journal. It's, in, it's a, a rhetoric journal. And one of the things that they're very popular for is this idea of early release of research. So the second they get something, it gets popped up there. And so this journal in the last 10 years, if I would have talked about this journal 10 years ago, nobody would have known what it was. This journal is totally taking off in my field because it's open access and it's got some of these things, but it also t it has an engagement with the audience as both readers and writers. So if you get a chance, you can go back and go look at their peer review process, but they do talk about all the articles in there are a conversation. And I think that these early, the way that they're kind of marketing themselves is, hey, this is something that we do. We put it out here early, but it's also open. So it's like they're not waiting for like a journal issue. They put kind of a volume number on it once they have the pieces to go, which I know some other journals do that. And then this is my flagship journal, um, who's, who's kind of trying to jump online. <laughs> um, and it's, this journal issue has been up there, I don't know, probably like three months. It's, the content is not new. And so I know many of us that do read the flagship journal in my field, it is a traditional print-based journal. You know, we'll read it, but we don't go and engage with the online content. It's because it's partially because it's it's not engaging with us regularly. It's not something that's got maybe a robust presence around just the print version of the the journal, and it's it's maybe a little traditional in that way. Um, this part about promoting and publishing the content. I, this is an opportunity for libraries that I think would be well served, and it's something I'm looking at right now when I go out and train other university um, academics, is talking about how you can use Twitter, how you can use some of these other things to promote your content and work with your publisher. So I mean, I'm working with my publisher because they keep saying, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, you come do this. I, I'm not saying, hey, can I promote my work through you? They're reaching out to me, but I, I don't know how to do that. I'm, I'm just learning. I've been a full professor now for six years. I mean, I've been around long enough to know. I've published enough articles to know, but I don't know this. And I think that this is something that librarians and publishers together, the library could be a great place to train that. So I want to show you a quick example of what that means. Here's a library, um, this is in New York, and they actually have workshops for faculty or academics about promoting your scholarship in a digital age. So just to get people to do this. All right, so that's a library example. This is one from Sage, and it's about, <laughs> yes, for some of you guys from Sage. Um, this is one about, it's providing guides to academics, like how to actually do the social media stuff. So I, prior to now, I mean, I didn't know something was out there like this, but I went and looked, sure enough, it's there. All right, and so the last thing that I want to leave you with then, on your tables there, you don't have to look at it at the moment, but if this print's too small, you can see it there. 
the the cycles change. Remember how we looked at it before and it was just a linear model? Now it's much more like a networked thing where all the pieces are sort of working together, where some of some of your research or some of your publication is no longer just sending it to the journal, getting your article accepted. It's also about the Twitter, it's also about the social media production, but it's also about you as a reader then citing someone else's research who has gone through that same cycle. So it's it's much more networked and I mean that's probably bound to happen because it is is more global. There's lots of different ways to connect now with the technology, but um, it just the model is different. And I think this is a spot where universities do need to step up and talk to academics about this because so many of the places, including where I went to school, taught us the linear model. Like that's what you do. You know, number one says no, you go to number two. You know, it's that sort of thing. Whereas this is much more, I think, the current norm. And and people are starting to realize that they need to have the education in all of the aspects of the publishing industry, not just okay. Well, I know how to get into the journal and do the writing. It's a lot more beyond that. I mean, you need to know quite a bit more. All right, so I'll leave you on that note. If you wanted to hear or look at any of the sources that I had talked about in this presentation, they're all up there on that handout as well. So the links are there. You can check anything out or come see me later. So thank you very much. Thank you. Great, can everyone hear me okay? Fantastic, I'm gonna take that as a yes. Um, so Christina has just been talking to us about um, the most appropriate conversational homes for academic content. And the idea that from very early on in their research, um, academics might think about which journal or which book series is the most appropriate place for um, their eventual publication. Um, but at Cambridge University Press, over the years, we've often heard from academics who say that the most appropriate home for their research might be something that is longer than a traditional article, but shorter than a traditional book. And um, for that, and many other reasons, um, a few years ago, two of my editorial colleagues had an idea for a new type of academic publishing that combines the best features of both books and journals. Now, for a university press that published thousands of books and journals each year, you might think that creating a hybrid like this would be pretty easy. Um, but actually, we found it to be surprisingly difficult um, in ways that perhaps naively we didn't fully anticipate at the time. So, for example, internally, we have very different workflows and data feeds for books and for journals. And externally, some cataloging systems and customers just want to know, is it a book or is it a journal? And my colleague's vision evolved into something that we now call Cambridge Elements. Um, Elements was launched officially last month, and so far we've published about 80 elements. Um, this slide gives you an overview of the Elements concept to provide some context for the rest of my presentation. Um, but I'm actually not going to be talking too much about Elements themselves today. And what I do want to do is talk you through the experiences we've had of trying to get the project off the ground, and some of the challenges we faced with setting up hybrid production workflows and optimizing discoverability and display for our hybrid product on our online platform. I'm also going to talk about the challenges around developing sales models for a hybrid product like this, and our experiences with trying to engage an external audience with this kind of a hybrid. So the Elements vision was pitched internally, and essentially the concept was developed by a group of enthusiasts at the press. Now this meant that everyone involved in developing both a proposition and also the infrastructure to make it happen had to do this on top of existing workloads. Now that might not sound ideal, but actually in retrospect, I think there were both pros and cons associated with this, so I'm going to try and unpick that a little bit. Firstly, the vision of Elements was all about moving beyond silos to create a new interdisciplinary hybrid product type. And this was definitely reflected by developing the idea and the infrastructure as a cross-functional interdisciplinary group of colleagues. But like I said, of course, these individuals didn't have spare capacity in their workloads before they took on this extra work. So this means we probably didn't nail down the internal pieces like um, author and series editor contracts and workflows and so forth as quickly as perhaps we should have done. It was also hard to build internal commitment at a time when we were reshaping our book's editorial strategy more generally and with more of a focus on reference and HE publishing as well. So we really were asking a lot of our book's editorial colleagues all at the same time. So in retrospect, we wonder if we were to do something like this again, whether we would set up a smaller, more tightly defined group to work on a project like this. 
But on the other hand, by situating elements within our existing structures and workloads, we were really able to capitalise on all of the relationships and the disciplinary knowledge that our colleagues had across um, books and journals, across the entirety of the subject areas that we, we publish in. I mean, a smaller separate unit for elements just couldn't have brought that breadth and depth of expertise across the sciences and the humanities and social sciences. So we think there are definitely pros and cons to both embedding new product development of this nature in existing structures and teams, and also potentially in setting up a new dedicated group to focus solely on the new initiative. Another challenge was achieving a balance between a consistent vision for elements across all of our publishing, but also recognising that a hybrid format could mean different things and potentially open up different opportunities in different subject areas. So to some, elements meant analytical forward-looking review articles or perhaps dynamic online handbooks on the fundamental building blocks of a subject and emerging frontier topics. But to others, elements were an opportunity to describe new technologies or new methodologies. And yet to others, the most exciting thing about elements was the opportunity afforded by a digital first content type to do things like including embedded audio, video, code, for example. And then we also wanted to make sure that authors had the opportunity to include original research where appropriate. So it was really important for us to find a way of allowing for all of these opportunities, while nevertheless making sure we had a consistent vision for elements for our authors, for our readers, and for our series editors, and for our institutional customers as well. Another challenge we faced early on was getting series editors on board before we had any published elements to show. So we could only explain the concept in abstract terms. So yes, again, the early series editors really had to be enthusiasts, um, but we actually found they were really excited by the chance to help shape an emerging form of scholarly communication. And one series editor commented that he really appreciated the chance to work each year with half a dozen top people on the most interesting topics in the field, rather than as a journal editor having to manage hundreds of submissions. As well as getting the vision off the ground and getting people on board, we also had to set up workflows in-house. We started from a position where we had very different and very separate books, processes and systems. But what we've ended up with is truly hybrid. So we're using book suppliers, book systems, books XML. But the touch points and turnaround times are much closer to what you'd expect for a journal. And we also use Scholar One, which was previously only used on the journal side of the business. There were lots of pros and cons that we had to weigh up when making decisions early on about which systems and workflows to use. So I want to talk through a few of those. First of all, choosing which markup language to use. So production colleagues felt that BITS comes with better documentation, but that JAX was potentially more fluid and would allow us to do more on our online, online platform. Quite early on, we decided that the work would be managed by colleagues who would previously worked on the book side of things. And so we decided to use book systems because our colleagues had greater familiarity with those, coupled with the fact that it was felt that metadata release and recording were better on the book side. But this meant that we were locked into using BITS with this approach quite early on. Having said that, using bits and book books processes allowed us to produce a much wider variety of outputs, so including EPUB and Mobi, as well as PDF and HTML. And our production colleagues also felt that we retained better QA of the digital product from uh, the book side of things. It would also have been challenging to apply for ISBNs um, if we'd gone down a journal's route. We would have had to create a lot more extra work for production and supply chain colleagues. There were quite a lot of advantages of drawing on aspects of both our books and our journals' workflows, but occasionally we've actually found there are aspects of one workflow that negate the time-saving capabilities from the other. And so to give you an example of this, um, we, and Scholar One fills into file, FileMaker, so in theory, this means that it prevents um, production colleagues having to spend the time of manually setting up a FileMaker record for each element. But our workflow on the book side is such that you actually have to create FileMaker, FileMaker records before entering the Scholar 1 phase, which prevents us from feeding data between the two systems. We also found that our hybrid model um, basically meant that we had to do um, more plumbing, or what we call plumbing infrastructural work. Because, for example, having integrated some third-party tools and services like CodeOcean and Overleaf into our journals publishing, we then had to do a lot more work to also integrate those four elements. So in retrospect, um, the use of different workflows and different typesetters for elements compared with journals um, has caused us a few problems. An example of that is because of the nature of the workflow we'd set up for elements, we found ourselves converting from LaTeX to Word and then from there following an XML workflow to produce all of the outputs we needed, including HTML. 
for the majority of LaTeX content, this has worked absolutely fine. But for one piece of content, the symbols were altered quite significantly by that conversion process, um, as a result of which we're now trialing direct LaTeX to XML conversion um, for elements with one of our um, journal suppliers for that really maths heavy content. And then lastly, on the production workflow side of things, um, with Elements, we give authors the opportunity to update their, uh, their content annually in order to keep it current. And the nature of those updates can really vary depending on how much the field has moved on since the original publication. So it could be the addition of a few sentences and a few new references. It could be a complete rewrite of the text, or it could simply just be the author signing off to say, actually, in the last year, there haven't been any changes that we need to make to this content. Um, so we think this is one of the really exciting things about Element, that ability to keep the content current. But in order to enable us to do that, we've had to create a rather more uh, manual work, workarounds than we would have liked. As well as updating, one of the things that really excited us most in the early days of Elements was the potential of a digital first content type to offer more than a traditional book or a traditional journal. So throughout, we've been encouraging authors and series editors to think about what they can do to add value to their elements as a teaching and research resource. So for example, things like uh, adding links to blogs, adding video, adding audio, um, adding, including data sets, adding executable code, and that sort of thing. On the other hand, we really envisaged print as very much a secondary format. So we designed elements with standardized text designs, standardized cover designs, and so forth. We knew that print was still really important, but one of the things that surprised us is just how much authors and series editors still value the print as a tangible, reader-friendly output of their research. So much so that I think we've had many, many more conversations with authors and series editors about print and the things like um, the precise quality of paper stock or cover designs or trim sizes than we have had about um, what, what people can do with digital capabilities. Some series editors and authors really have taken the opportunity to make the most of the options afforded by a digital first content type. So for example, we're about to publish an element with executable code embedded throughout the content. But on the other hand, we haven't seen much appetite to include embedded audio and embedded video, for example. And then when authors have taken the opportunity to make the most of digital first capabilities, we've then had to think really carefully about how we represent those elements in print. So we've had to work with the authors to rewrite some aspects of the text for the more interactive elements to make sure that they still do make sense in print. We also had to make changes to our online platform, Cambridge Core, to accommodate elements as a third stream of publishing alongside books and journals. Originally, Cambridge Core was set up to recognize all content either as a book or a chapter as a component of a book or an article as a component of a journal. But of course, elements aren't books or journals, but simultaneously both and neither. So we've created a new content type for elements on our platform, which introduced more back-end work to support this. We've also designed a new content page on Cambridge Core, which incorporates features of both books and articles. And similarly, we've designed series pages in new to accommodate features both of journal pages and of book series pages. Being able to design elements on Core in this bespoke way has brought a lot of advantages, but there are also disadvantages to setting up a new content type in this way. And now we're finding that every time we do work on the platform, either for our journals or for our books or for both, we have to do extra work to do it for elements as well. Ah, your screen has just temporarily started working and then unstopped again. There you go. So lastly, I want to talk a little bit about the challenges of selling a hybrid product to the outside world. And by that, I mean both traditional sales but also trying to explain the concept to um, indexing and abstracting bodies and other types of publishing partners. So pricing a new format and predicting sales was challenging because we didn't have anything that we'd done before to directly compare with. So we discussed the concept at length with librarians at our regular library panel meetings to test our assumptions and to craft sales models that took due account of their budget constraints and their priorities. So what did librarians tell us? Well, they told us it's important to be as flexible as possible, giving them the option to buy elements on a title by title basis or as part of collections. Another factor that was really important in determining sales models was the expectation that elements could be used in the teaching of upper level undergraduate and graduate courses. So this meant it was really important to make them available on the basis of unlimited usage and perpetual access so that instructors could have total freedom to use elements in their course packs at no cost to the students. We expected some individuals might wish to purchase elements um, either as print or as ebooks, so we have made them available in those formats. But to be honest, we really didn't expect the individual market to be significant. 
And evidence so far has suggested a much stronger market for print on demand than we'd anticipated. And then finally on sales, some of our sales team have reported it difficult to succinctly explain elements to customers. And because those people just want to know, look, you're talking about this new thing, but is this a book or is it a journal? And speaking of the need to fit into this book journal dichotomy, this is something we've come across again and again when trying to explain elements to other publishing partners, such as um, indexing bodies. So here again, in theory, elements should have the best of both worlds. They should be indexed um, for discovery and impact in all the ways you'd expect of a journal and available in all the formats you'd expect of a book. One of the things we've done to help with this is creating both ISBNs for elements and ISSNs for elements series. So for example, we need ISBNs to make sure that elements are included in library catalogues at the individual title by title basis and also for individual purchase of elements, whether in print or e-formats. And then ISSNs are needed for indexing with discovery partners. So for example, there's a requirement that ISSNs are included in the meta tags for elements on our online platform, basically to make sure that they're indexed um, appropriately and fully by a Google Scholar. But again, this hasn't been straightforward. So we create ISSNs for elements at the outset, but because we're using book systems and books processes, it's been challenging to pull them through all of the different backend systems to make sure they don't get lost in translation. So we've had to do yet more work there as well. And then just recently, there's been a further complication because we've been speaking in detail with Google Scholar about elements. And they've actually advised that not only do we need to include the ISSN meta tag, we need to remove or suppress the ISBN meta tag in order for them to be discoverable within Scholar. Now, this is problematic for us for many reasons. Like I said, we need the ISBN in other, for other purposes, and we don't want our metadata to be inconsistent between different places. Um, even more than that, we also very specifically need that ISBN um, citation tag in order to be able to apply altmetric badges to elements. So that's still work in progress, um, but we're finding that it's really quite challenging to do all of the outreach we need to make sure that elements are appropriately treated and, and managed by all of the different um, third-party partners we work with. But I would say we've had some definite successes in that area. One example being confirmation that elements are eligible for submission to the REF. So if we could have our time again, what do we think we might have done differently in trying to set up this kind of a hybrid product? We might try to work with a smaller, more tightly defined group to get the project off the ground without the distractions of existing workloads. In hindsight, we're aware that the books component of our workflow has introduced various problems, such that some colleagues are saying, should we actually have gone down the journal's route instead? But to be completely honest, we think that if we'd have done that, we'd be standing here now saying, well, going down the journal's route introduced all of these other problems, but actually we should have gone down the book's route instead. And it's definitely true to say that it, having used our book systems and workflows for elements has allowed us to trial and innovate in ways that have benefited our wider books business as a whole. Again, in retrospect, I think we would have given more, think more weight to um, thinking about print from the outset. The continued emphasis on the nitty gritty of the aesthetics of print and the demand for individual P POD purchase has really exceeded our expectations. But actually, on the whole, I think we've got it right. In the early days, we were a little bit worried that early career scholars in particular might be reluctant to commit because elements don't start out with an impact factor and they were untried and untested and there was no guarantee of recognition by tenure committees, for example. But our experience so far suggests that actually people are willing to take the risk. The format has been especially appealing to people working with mixed methodologies or in interdisciplinary fields. So for those of you who might be thinking about doing something similar or experimenting with other new content types, we see this as a really encouraging sign and maybe an indication of more appetite for and more recognition for alternative, alternative forms of scholarly communication. Thanks very much. Great, thank you very much both for those excellent and interesting uh, presentations. I, I went to a, um, a, a trade publishing conference about 10 years ago and the chief executive of Faber stood up and said, we're doing things in a new way now. People bring us an idea and some content and then we think about how we should be communicating it. Is it a book, is it an app, is it a, a book series or a, a magazine or what? And uh, it was great to, to hear both speakers really talking about authors of, of, re of research saying, well, 
what's the best home for my material and how can this be, best be expressed. So I think that's, um, that's very uh, interesting and encouraging. Um, I'm slightly traumatized by putting the reader first. I'm going to have to rename the conference Reader from Researcher. Um, which I'm not sure I'm ready to do. Um, so I've been following along on Twitter. There have been some interesting points and questions raised on Twitter. Um, Twitter a little less angry during this session than in the previous session, so that's <laughs> progress, I guess. Um, so I'm going to invite questions in a moment, and um, if when you, you're given a microphone, if you could stand up and say your name, that would be useful both to the, uh, to the audience and the videographers. So um, I see right at the back there's somebody there. Is that Kent? Hi, Kent Anderson from Red Link. I've been to both Cleveland and Cambridge, so. In fact, I've been to Findlay, so I caught that. Um, so a question for you, Dr. Tully. I, when I've worked at, as a publisher on high impact journals with popular sections, uh, would take the editors to actually meet the readers. And they are, their conceptualization of who their reader was would be dramatically undermined by them actually meeting the readers. So two questions from that. One, have, has your research actually gone to that step where you've taken your authors to actually meet their readers? And, and what were the results of that, if so? And then second, when I saw it, I realized it actually didn't matter because they weren't going to change their conceptualization and it was actually effective. So even if you were to have a true read of the readers instead of a false conceptualization, does it matter? All right, so there's two ways to think about this. I actually work with the journal very closely. It's published by Elsevier. I am the reviews editor for Computers and Composition. And so I'm thinking about your question in a way that I know that I have to interact with some of the readers of the journal because if I'm publishing book reviews, I have to put a book in the journal that others are going to want to read, like when I choose to publish a review. So um, thinking about that, I know that I've had some conversations um, with the computers and writing community. This is another one of my, my side disciplines that I worked with. Um, and, and by doing that, we tend to have an annual conference every year. And so one of my jobs, and I do feel that um, this journal, Computers and Composition, is doing a, a good job at this, is trying, you know, trying to figure out who the readers are and get that conception. Um, one of my jobs at that conference is not to go to the sessions, it's just to be on the move and be talking to everybody in the coffee line and you know when we're looking at the exhibits and that sort of thing and just say you know hey are you subscribing to the journal what kinds of books are you reading and really talk to them that field is small enough that it can be done on that kind of a personal scale for some of these journals you know their conception of what their readers might be it, it might be a journal that reaches so many people you couldn't even know and you wouldn't even have a coherent vision of what that readership would be anyway um, i am working with that a little bit you know just because i have my own personal experience with it um, in terms of how i'm working with that with the um, academics that i work with one of the things that I'd, I'd said is to actually like reach out to the journal and see if there's a way that you can get involved, either as a manuscript reviewer, um, sometimes they need people for the editorial board, and some journals are more amenable to that than others. Um, my discipline of rhetoric and writing is a, is a young field. It's like dated around the late 1960s in the US. So virtually the people, the scholars in my field, most of, most of them are still alive. So you can interact with them, you can talk with them. They've founded most of the journals, so I can kind of operate on that scale. In some of these other fields, I, I think it would be a, a bit more difficult. And I do agree with you that that conception of who the reader might be might not be what's actually happening on the ground. Okay, thank you. Another question from someone? Uh, some from there. I'm Helen Stewart from ProQuest. Um, I have a question for Nisha. It's probably a marathon question, but um, uh, we're interested in, um, in, in the discovery services and you saying about Google not being able to do ISSNs and ISBNs? Is that something you've heard from other discovery services? Um, and, and what role is DOR, a DOI is playing in, in linking to those elements? Sure. Um, so taking the question about ISBNs and ISSNs, then on the whole, we haven't heard from anyone else that it's specifically a problem. Although the recent advice from Google Scholar is part, partly what I just said, but also partly that actually if a discovery system sees both an ISSN and an ISBN, it thinks that there's something wrong because it only expects one or the other, expects them to be mutually exclusive. And so while we haven't heard that from anyone else yet, I don't know necessarily that it wouldn't arise elsewhere. 
Um, in terms of DOIs, then yes, I see also on the Twitter feed someone has asked, do elements have DOIs? So the answer is yes, they do. Um, we are submitting elements to um, Crossref essentially as if they were books, but again, also making sure that the book series data and the ISSNs are submitted as well. Um, and we're also, um, we're also making sure that we apply DOIs to the different versions, the updates that I mentioned, so that you can link the, um, the different versions, but so they're also um, recorded separately. So for example, if someone cites an element, we want it to be easy to track back which version you cited in case there are differences and in case someone thinks that actually, you know, something's changed, perhaps there's been a contradiction. We want it to be really clear that some, which, which version someone's citing. So part, part of that work is the stuff that I said that there's more manual workarounds than we'd like because actually getting our systems in place to be able to do all of that seamlessly is, is not as easy as it might sound. Thank you. Uh, another question? Uh, so there's a lady here and then perhaps somebody in the middle. No. Hi, uh, Anna Clements from University of St Andrews. Um, we obviously heard about Plan S this morning and I was wondering whether in your thinking you've thought about Plan S compliance and how you might achieve that? This is Tanisha. Yeah. Specifically for elements. Um, so, so yeah, we, we have. So I would start out by saying for elements that um, at the moment we have both gold and green options. Um, these are, I guess, not really um, Plan S compliance specifically, but we have um, a gold open access option where you pay the equivalent of an article processing charge or a book processing charge. The cost is a little bit between the two, as you might expect. Um, to make an element fully gold open access, or we also have green open access policies, so you can um, you can put your submitted manuscript anywhere in a, in a repository or whatever you might want to do with it um, in that way, but then there are restrictions on the version, what you can do with the version of record at the moment, although our policies there could evolve as, as, as things evolve in the open access world in general. Um, at the moment, our thinking about Plan S, I have to say, is primarily focused on our journals specifically, in part because, as we've discussed earlier today, the, the guidance around books and anything that is not a journal um, is, is fuzzier. So our thinking is, is evolving there too, but in terms of ex exactly what we're doing, there's less to say explicitly right now about what we're doing to make sure we're compliant with Plan S, specifically for elements or for books. Okay, thank you. There was someone in the middle there. You've changed my mind. No, someone there. Yeah, it's you. Yeah, okay. Uh, Mark Allen, thank you very much, by the way, both of you. Um, it's a truism in publishing that I believe we think as generically about authors as we do about content and don't think differentially about what might motivate them. And the other truism is that publishing in a peer-reviewed journal is good for your career and maybe publishing a book is less so. And you talked a little bit about, about this, Christine, but with reference to early career researchers and the changing landscape of journal publishing, about how you think about the impact on a career of taking a particular publishing route, just in general from your research, and then, Nisha, how did you motivate authors to publish in Elements, given that it was neither of those two formats and maybe not obvious what the benefit to them might be? Okay, so, yeah, so starting with that one, um, thinking about it from the point of view um, whether to go a journal article route first or a book, this is very location specific and it's also obviously a matter of time. So um, there are, there's a rising group of universities in the US called Comprehensives and there's sort of this weird mid ground between um, very research heavy oriented universities and then very small liberal arts colleges that might have more of a teaching focus. Um, so what happens in a comprehensive place like mine, I come from one of those universities, is that anything goes. You could go either route and it is really on, do you have the capability to do a book and see it through? I mean, it, it, I know the publishers and I know there, we probably have lots of authors that you're chasing for various manuscripts right now because they can't close the loop and get it finished. And so I, I think it, it, that is a very much of an individual choice. Do you have the attention span to sustain interest on a topic to do a book? You know, there, you have to really be in love with your project to do it. And, and that's something that when I work with uh, new academics, we talk about that a lot. Because if you're the type of person that burns out on a topic very, very quickly, or you have a study that's not really meant to be a book, it's just not. It's much more sized for a journal article than that's the route to go. Um, certain institutions will, cert will dictate to you what it has to be. So at University of Michigan, when I do work there, everybody needs a book 
for tenure, everybody. And really, you need a second one in contract, in press, you know, ready to go to shoot out the minute that you're going to get it. And that, that's just the minimum right now. That's the minimum expectation. Whereas at my institution, to get tenure, you need six peer-reviewed articles. So if you do a book, they'll basically collapse some of those. It'll be a book and three articles or, or something like that. So I do think the, the, um, the advice might be very specific, but if all things are equal and anything could go, I, I do think it's a matter of attention span. And I do think that that's also a publisher's responsibility a little bit to talk with the authors about this is what it takes. You have this great idea and you're all excited about it, but this is what it really takes to make that thing happen and all the things that go into it, like building an index and things like that that, you know, as a new author, sometimes come as a bit of a surprise. Yeah, so in answer to your question about specifically how we motivated um, authors to, to do elements, and um, then again, I, re I would echo what you just said about the fact that actually in, in some disciplines it's not necessarily the case that it's all just about journal articles, it's very much about write, writing books as well. Um, so really because elements were, um, the, the idea for elements was very much um, informed by what um, our authors were telling us about their frustrations with both journals and with books, and also what they liked about both of those things, what worked for them about them. So we, we took both of those and tried to make something that m sort of met all of the good things, but spoke to some of the disadvantages as well. So when we were talking with authors about how this might work for them, we were talking about how there are frustrations around the length of time that peer review takes, but nevertheless the importance of peer review, um, and the length of time that production um, of a, a book in particular, but also of an article might take. So um, for elements, they are very much peer reviewed, but the, the, the time is a lot quicker than you might get with journals publishing. And similarly, production, we do copy editing and so forth, but the, the time is much quicker than you might expect for an article. So we really were trying to explain to authors in, across all, all the different areas, not just in terms of speed, um, what elements can do for them that really enable them to meet their goals better or faster. And I would also say again that specifically the conversations around what, what might motivate an author and how you might sort of tailor that conversation again, I think have been very discipline specific. And that was one of the areas where I said it's actually been really important that this has been, this idea has been developed by our colleagues who work in all of those disciplines on a day to day basis already. So for example, when we started out working on elements, I wasn't in my current role, I was actually a medical books um, acquisitions editor. So for the conversations that I was having with authors, um, we were talking a lot about um, the, the, the value of being able to update your content, for example, and to keep it current and the digital side of things. And that was what really excited them about elements. But then one of my colleagues on the humanity side might have been having a very different conversation, looking at different aspects of the, the, the elements vision, I guess. So, so yeah, we've really, we've really been able to tailor it in a way that works for authors in different areas and in slightly different ways, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. If somebody wants to ask one last one. Ooh, the screen's come back, how exciting. Um, no, no more? Okay, um, right, well, let, would you join me then in thanking our two speakers for their, their great contribution? Thank you very much. So I've got a couple of um, minor things to cover and then I'm going to send you early to lunch with a bit of luck, so that'll be great. Um, so just a couple of things I need to talk about. Uh, just again to mention the, uh, our two silver sponsors and their materials on the tables there, um, so do pick up those and have a look. Um, this front table here was reserved for speakers just for the first session, but you are allowed to sit at it now. So after lunch, do feel free to come and sit right at the front here under the eye of the chair. And, uh, and this table is available, so I thought I had to mention that. Um, uh, surveys, this is a great opportunity to uh, miss the initial lunch click queue by filling in your survey to date. So find your yellow piece of paper and fill it in, please. Um, and I think uh, the last thing, yes, so uh, when we go to lunch, if you've um, notified us of a special dietary requirement, um, then please talk to people with red badges and red lanyards um, and uh, they will guide you um, uh, regarding special plates that have been laid out or uh, any special uh, arrangements that have been made. Um, I think if you're a common or garden vegetarian, there's a nice vegetarian option, but if you have more specific, sophisticated requirements, then please talk to uh, somebody with a red badge and a red lanyard. So thank you very much. Um, off to lunch and see you back here promptly at 150. Thank you very much. <laughs>